annual JQD Heritage Month. My name is Carmel Tanaka, she, her pronouns, and I am the founder and executive director of JQD Vancouver, a volunteer run Jewish, queer, and trans nonprofit whose mission is to queer Jewish space and to Jewify queer space. And we do that here in Vancouver on the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Slavel Tooth peoples. JQD is also the only Jewish LGBTQ nonprofit in Canada. To celebrate the queering of Jewish Heritage Month throughout the month of May, we are featuring Jewish queer and trans artists from our JQD wall of artists. For more details, check out our wall and who knows, maybe even get featured too. The link is in the chat and you can go check that out. Today's event, Queer Jewish Languages, features a dream lineup of guests from near and far who are linguists and or everyday speakers of queer Jewish languages. In just a moment, we will get a chance to meet each of our guests, but first, some housekeeping items. Please stay muted during the recording of the 40 minute panel discussion. <clears throat> The panel discussion will be on how each of our guests are querying their respective Jewish languages. You can keep your camera on or off, whatever feels comfy to you. The panel will be posted to JQD's Facebook and YouTube channels with closed captioning by the end of May. Following the discussion, we will end the recording and you will be invited to join a 20 minute mini lesson with a guest of your choosing to learn a few Jewish queer terms, and or some grammar. We will regroup together at the end for a few parting words before logging off on Zoom. And this part will also be recorded. I invite our event co-partner, Sarah Benor from the Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religions Jewish Language Project to say a few words. Thank you so much, Carmel. And wow, what a great, exciting lineup we have today. Uh, I run the Jewish Language Project at HUC, which raises awareness about and encourages research on Jewish languages. And queer Jewish languages are, of course, part of that. And we're thrilled to be hosting our very first event on that topic. If you're interested in other events on Jewish languages, you can go to jewishlanguages.org and sign up for our mailing list and see videos of all of our previous events. And enjoy this one. Wonderful. Yay. Thank you so much for partnering with us on this. Uh, it's, it's amazing that even during a time like the pandemic, we're able to meet people and collaborate uh, across borders these days. And so this is really very special for us here at JQD. Okay, it's time to meet all of our guests. When I call upon you, please share your name, your pronouns, and briefly share how you are querying your respective Jewish language. And we shall begin with Eyal Rivlin. Shalom friends. So my name is Eyal Rivlin. I use he, him pronouns, and um, I run the Hebrew program at the University of Colorado in Boulder. I have been teaching here for 11 years now, and I am also along with the wonderful Lior Gross, who you'll hear more about soon, uh, and the co-creator of the Non-Binary Hebrew Project, um, which is a systematics that we developed to add a non-binary third gender option to Hebrew to allow it to be more inclusive and honoring of all people. Thank you so much, Eyal. Uh, for those, by the way, who are looking for live transcripts, you need to enable that at the bottom of your Zoom. I do have it on, so you can take a look at that. Uh, we shall go next to Nessie Altaras. Hi, I, my name is Nessie Altaras. I use he, him pronouns. Uh, it's really good to be here. Um, how I arrived at this topic was um, I wanted to see, because queer people have wasted for a very long time, how Ladino during its peak times, now it's uh, less spoken less, you identified and discussed queer people. And from that, I kind of opened this box of like possibilities of what we can use today still uh, as we bring new life into this language. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Nessie. Faith Nomi Jones. Hi, I'm Faith Jones. My Yiddish name is Nomi. I use she, her pronouns. Um, so I, I 
try to think really hard about um, about Yiddish words that we use in different ways. And I try to be uh, very deliberate in how I use the language. I try to make um, as many of our new terminology as possible uh, accessible. I try to make it live in our language. I, um, I work at a college where the majority of our students are Punjabi speakers. And um, they asked me recently to help them find out what the word is for lesbian in Punjabi. And there is not one. And they have had a lot of um, difficulty uh, trying to figure out what would be an appropriate term for themselves. So this is the kind of thing where what we see is um, if the word isn't live in the culture, if it isn't being used, if it isn't part of regular speech, then it can't enter the lexicon because other people don't recognize it. So what I try to do is I try to use as many of our beautiful que queer words as possible in uh, texts that I write and in when I speak in public in Yiddish. That's fantastic and beautiful work. So, so important. And I'm curious to know if a word has been created yet by the community. Maybe soon. Okay, we next have a duo. Uh, first uh, is Grace Elizabeth D and then Ellen Perleberg. Um, Grace Elizabeth first. Thank you. Hi, I'm Grace Elizabeth. I use they, them pronouns. And I, along with my wonderful colleague, Ellen, are the co-principal investigators of the University of Washington sociolinguistics project called Yale Yale, the development and acceptance of queer Jewish language in Seattle. And I'm Ellen. I have the honor to get to work with Grace. And our study, Yale Yale, focuses on all the language and languages used by queer Jewish people in Seattle, including queer Jewish English, Bar Mitzvah Hebrew, Ladino Heritage Language Learners, and more. Wonderful. I'm so happy to have both of you here. Uh, last but definitely not least is Yosef J. Nem on board. Hello, everyone. My name is Yosef. My pronouns are he, him for now. I'm here in Los Angeles, and I am the Director of Community Programs, newly appointed Director of Community Programs at JQ International here in Los Angeles. I'm a part of the Persian community um, here is the second, uh, is the largest diaspora community outside of Iran here in Los Angeles. And uh, for me, it's a lot about creating or melding the identity or developing the identity and the languages simultaneously because both right now similar to the Punjabi community is in some ways suppressed. So we're working on creating identity and, and building that piece with it as well. Well, everyone, this is our rock star lineup of guests. Uh, thank you very much for taking a moment to introduce yourselves. We're gonna dive a little bit deeper now uh, to get a chance uh, to get to know you and your work a bit more. First question, why do you do what you do? It's actually two parts. Why do you do what you do? And what brought you to queer your respective Jewish language? Is there someone who would like to go first? I could jump Faith. in. Go ahead. Um, yeah, queer words were pretty, pretty slow to appear in Yiddish. And we did spend quite a few years trying to figure out what words we could use that would make Jewish uh, queer lives visible in Yiddish. And it was, it's been, it's been actually much slower than you would think, given the number of people, uh, queer people involved in Yiddish for, for decades, for many decades. Um, but like, I remember trying to explain who my partner was in Yiddish. And um, if I use the word for partner uh, in, in Yiddish, it can also mean roommate, which is exactly what I was trying not to do. So it's, there's these complications. Um, I know some some lesbians of a sort of a generation a bit older than me would use the term partner care using the English word and adding a feminine feminine suffix in Yiddish, which is extremely charming. Uh, the only problem with it is it doesn't translate well when you have Yiddish speakers who come from a non English speaking context. So when you're speaking to somebody from Russia or Poland, they wouldn't necessarily have the word partner isn't isn't useful for them. So it's been very slow trying to figure out how what kinds of words we could use. And um, it just sort of it just sort of feels as if there's finally 
um, enough real interest in tackling that, in tackling the language part of it. And so now there's been this sort of blossoming in the last maybe five or six years of, uh, of queer words. Um, and so there's, there's a number of people who I'll probably mention later working on this project of creating uh, queer words and hopefully down the road also queer grammar. Thank you so much, Faith. You know, that's really important because, you know, running a, a, a queer Jewish organization, I am usually, well, what I've been seeing online and in community has been mostly queer Yiddish. And so if anything, I know it's slow going, but, you know, that's the most prominent in terms of all the languages here and uh, really excited to have uh, other voices and to share with us their experiences. Uh, perhaps I can call upon Eyal to go next. Happy to. So maybe I'll share the origin story of the non-binary Hebrew project just briefly to, to give us context and then kind of how, how it evolved to, to queer Hebrew. And so about four years ago, um, as I was getting to, uh, ready to launch another semester, a prospective student by the name of Lee Orgros, whom I've mentioned, uh, reached out and asked to, to join my Hebrew class. And I noticed that at the bottom of the email, the signature said they, them pronouns. And I said, of course, you're welcome to join. And by the way, what are your thoughts about uh, pronouns and speaking in Hebrew? Because up to that point, I, I've had students who identified as trans, uh, but I didn't have somebody in my Hebrew class that identified as, as non-binary. So Lior said, you know, I'm not sure. And I wasn't quite sure either. And so we both decided to do some research. And I called educators in Israel that I've known and family members and learned that it actually, it wasn't clear what to do in Hebrew. Uh, people were mostly switching between masculine and feminine, sometimes even mid-sentence, what's called Lashon Mo'evet, but there was still no option that was truly non-binary. And uh, in a sense, one was still forced by the language to choose within the system as, as either masculine or feminine. And for those of you who, who know a little bit of Hebrew, even words like, like you, uh, are either masculine or feminine. Similarly, a word like they in Hebrew would be masculine or feminine. So the language itself is a lot more binary than English. And so what we did is we first looked at other languages like, like Spanish, for example, uh, and see to see what, what, what's, what's being done. How, how are people doing this? And you know we, we learned about words like Latinx and, and stuff like that. And uh, we started exploring what suffix could we use in Hebrew that would truly be non-binary. And it was important for me to have it be authentic to Hebrew. So for example, like an X suffix in Hebrew wouldn't be authentic to the language itself. So what we landed up after experimenting with, with some, uh, some options was the, the E ending. Like uh, in, in Hebrew, it would be a segol in the letter He or E-H in, in English. And I'll, I'll explain more of that in the, in the breakout session. It, it takes a minute to explain and you all could be walking away knowing how to use this uh, after the, the breakout room. And so people who, you know, people have a little bit of background, literally in a minute could learn how to apply this to, to verbs and nouns and adjectives and, and conjugate things. And so, so to come back to your question of why it was the right thing to do as an ally, as a white cis male in a position of, of privilege as an educator, and it created a, a welcoming environment in the class and helped other students attune to the power of language to either include or exclude. And then it went viral online. We, we put it up on a website online and many people from really all over the world started using it in Sidurim, in prayer books, in congregations, in Hebrew schools all over the country. And uh, maybe I'll pause here and add more later. That's a great segue because I'm one of those people who used the grammar that you created, that you and your uh, partner created uh, for querying Jewish prayers for a non-binary option for, for people. And we've used that, oh my gosh, so many times, whether it's for lighting Shabbos candles or um, lighting the Hanukkah and all of this is available on JQD's website uh, under resources for queer Jewish blessings. Uh, I worked together with um, Reb Erwin Keller to help with the nekudot, which are the vowels in Hebrew, uh, because I, I don't have the fancy keyboard to do all of that. Uh, but we applied the grammar and, and I hope we did it okay. <laughs> I mean, I think we did. It's uh, become quite user-friendly uh, and not to steal any of the scene, but you know, I, I do speak some Hebrew as well. Um, my mom's Israeli 
And uh, I remember when I first was doing it, I know it hurts the ears. Like I, I, I understand, but as the more I do it, I realize how beautiful and how inclusive it is and that language is constantly evolving. And we're on different pages in our journey when it comes to querying our, our respective Jewish language. And this for me has been so beautiful because it really helps people feel included and the the feedback we get from our community is it's pretty incredible so on that note speaking of inclusion i saw one of the coolest posts uh around and it was by nessie alteras and so i think i'm gonna post i'm gonna post you next to to share a little bit about why you do what you do sure um well i came to this topic from general activism with the Ladino and like trying to revivify the language. And what I've done before as well was basically using the language as an archive. Um, a lot of the things we need now, uh, we already have the background for because our language uh, is quite rich in its history and literary traditions. And obviously going back, I thought, okay, we need to look at how we discuss queer people and how they hopefully use the uh, words for themselves in the past, because obviously they existed in the past as well. Um, so when, but when I was inspired to do this, actually at a time in Turkey where I'm from, uh, and I'm currently in Istanbul also, um, at a time when the pressure on queer people in Turkey was increasing. So in 2020, uh, queer people were more directly targeted by the government, like more than ever before in explicit terms. And at that time, I ran into this discussion among Kurdish people. So, you know, lots of uh, cross support with other minority languages uh, about how to identify queer people and what translators should do and how non-queer translators were intervening in this process of choosing words. Um, and I thought, okay, our language must have these sorts of debates and this sort of content already. So I asked a lot of older, fluent speakers of the language, how would you identify um, queer people? And, and they came up with many, many words. Um, some of them explicitly negative, others less so. And many of them, I think, have the potential to be reclaimed. Um, and of course, as the language gets more and more popular with young people who are trying to learn it and have their grandparents practice with them, I think it's uh, gonna evolve in a direction that becomes more inclusive. Um, for example, when I wrote about this book for the first time, I thought the term culo alegre, which means a uh, happy ass, uh, it was a, one of the term that, terms that people had heard of before and where it was used from early 1900s uh, all the way up to the 50s and 60s probably. I thought that sounded pretty, uh, pretty pleasant and possibly could be useful. But then I was talking to another uh, user of Ladino, Professor Devin Nahr, uh, from Seattle, who suggested that maybe just Alegres was cleaner and uh, had a more positive feel to it. And I, I think that makes sense. So I think, so when I talked to him about this topic again, I just used that and obviously he understood uh, and that has entered our lexicon. So I think, because it's also very clear to any English speaker who would know the word gay, that's another advantage of using that word. Um, and it generally has a positive feel to it, but there's obviously all sorts of different things and I'll get into in the little breakout session. Thank you so much, Nessie. Uh, you're bringing up uh, really interesting points of the, the crossing over over languages and the adopting of words, the using them, the positive and the, the uh, appropriation, but also the uh, positive embracing of terms. I know that during the Jewish queer and trans oral history project that we just did uh, in British Columbia, when I would use this, the term queer, uh, it, it didn't always have the best response. Uh, and I'm sure um, Grace Elizabeth and Ellen can say a little something to that. So why don't I put you on the hotspot to share a little bit more about what, why you do what you do? Sure. Um, I guess I 
got into querying language a lot through personal experience. So my first uh, languages that I was exposed to at home were Hokkien, uh, which is like Taiwanese, and Tagalog, which has like relatively minimal gendering, especially when it comes to like personal pronouns. And then learning English at the age of like four to five and learning like, okay, people have pro, um, gen like gender pronouns as well. And then learning Hebrew later in life. And you know, I'm like, great, you're telling me the sky and the table also have genders, like what is happening? Um, and kind of being able to draw on all those different experiences and say um, what possibilities exist. And I think, so we work a bit in Jewish English, which is kind of like conversational amongst American Jews, particularly, um, and just finding words that are able to fit the experience, like talking to a non-binary, uh, a parent of a non-binary kid saying, do I call it a bar mitzvah, um, B mitzvah, bat mitzvah, et cetera. And I think just a huge part of inclusion for me is creating opportunities for self-determination, I think. Um, and part of knowing how you want to best express your queer identity is knowing what options are available. So that launched Ellen and I into doing an ethnographic study of seeing what are people doing, what options exist out there and um, letting people choose what works best for them, if anything. And if not, let's dream together. So. Big, big fast to all of that. And I really want to highlight that a lot of this for me has been because we have queer and trans kids using this language. And as that is something on the hot seat of the news, I think it is really important to highlight that we do have queer and trans kids who are in environments where people are trying their best to support them, to keep them safe. And how much of that has involved language, how much this, that does involve the 12 year old stressing over their Torah portion and also over whether it's called a B mitzvah or a bar mitzvah. Because religion is such a huge site of language transmission in the formal sense of Hebrew school, of heritage language learning, but also of the conversational everyday. It's where you pick up the little words for your community. And it's also a site where people learn gender and learn, learn values and learn how to perform gender. And all of that together makes this a really, really important site for what we think about when we think about queer and trans kids. That's that's really important, Ellen, what you raised here are some of the challenges that we face querying uh, our respective Jewish languages. And so I think this is a good segue into the next question. And Yosef, I was wondering if you could share a little bit about you know, why you do what you do, but also what are what are some of the, the good, the bad, and the ugly when it comes to querying uh, Farsi? Thank you. So yeah, like Nessie mentioned and Nomi mentioned, there's many languages where um, the particular querying of the languages has like, it is hard to find or hasn't existed or hasn't fully integrated into the language. Um, for me in particular, why I'm interested in this, in this field is because when I was growing up, I did not really have the language, neither in English, because it wasn't spoken about in English at all, or in Farsi, um, in the Persian language, it was something pretty taboo, wasn't really touched. And all of the words that kind of surround queerness, like, um, like Nessie mentioned, are um, mostly derogatory, haven't really found for myself that really good um, word that really fits that we, yet that we can you know hold our shoulders high and you know kind of where I be proud and where our identities in our first language so that's been a huge challenge um just the lack of representation and in, in the language uh the other piece that I would say that has been um a challenge is that leads to a lot of censorship um and gatekeeping of the language um we found that um even in discussing these topic points, people are still very uncomfortable here in Los Angeles in the Persian community here, just uh, discussing it. Um, for example, uh, I work at JQ International, like I mentioned, and um, I didn't spearhead this, but my amazing colleague, Arya Marvazi and Amanda Madahi started this Persian Pride Fellowship. Um, and in three to four years of our program, Thankfully, we have had a fellowship with 
40 ish people being out and proud and that has started a whole movement um and we're growing still but there's still kind of this every other day i hear someone telling me that you know their parents family uses this term or that term that similar to to nessie was it happy butt was it happy butt did i miss it? happy ass yeah similar similar to that but without the happy um you know so uh, those are some of the challenges, and I think that also bleeds into some of our literature. The good is that the, the, the Persian language is really uh, poetic, and I think draws on like very, very many languages. Um, so there's a lot of room and space to kind of grow, and it's, it's really melting pot of a, of a language. So we're excited for what's ahead and um, excited to see where that takes us. And so much. In, oh, go ahead. One more go thing. Ahead. In my group, we'll be going through some of the queer Persian Farsi that exists. Oh, it's so going to be so good. I hope you're all yeah. thinking about which room you're going to want to be in for the lesson. And uh, you can only pick one, although you can uh, bounce between the rooms. It'd be nice if you could stick uh, in the room and support. The person you choose. Uh, speaking of queer Farsi, uh, someone who we have with us in attendance today is calligrapher Ruben Shimonov of Sephardic Mizrahi Q Network. Uh, and they created a gorgeous image, um, which was featured earlier. It's posted on JQD socials right now. Uh, basically what it is, it's a gender neutral third person pronoun uh, pronounced as U. And it's in Farsi with the word Aziz, meaning dear, inside, and with colors inspired by the non-binary flag. Merci, Ruben. It's absolutely stunning. Uh, we can share that later on. Or, oh, Sarah's sharing it right now. Fantastic. Thank you so much. So this is the beautiful graphic uh, that uh, Ruben put together for us. Isn't that so, so lovely? Thank you so much, Sarah, for doing that. Okay, so are there other challenges uh, to querying your language that you would like to share? Yeah, I just wanted to respond to what Yosef was saying about, uh, you know, there's a kind of purism that can sort of come up from our from our Yiddish speaking community. And um, that is, you know, that is a, a challenge for us as well. I think um, there's a strong sense that we don't want Yiddish to disappear into English. We don't want to absorb so many English words that it becomes English. Or if you're in Israel, we don't want it to absorb so many Hebrew words that it becomes Hebrew. And so it's sort of understandable that there's this kind of purism around it. And I get that. Um, so the solution that sort of we've sort of come up with is to try and make terminology and grammatical forms that pull really strongly from forms and vocabulary that do have deep roots in Yiddish. So we kind of build words on top of words that already exist, or we try and, you know, the grammar side of it, which is really not as well developed, you know, trying to find grammatical forms that would make sense within the Yiddish um, case structure. Um, and that's obviously that is a harder task and it is slower, but hopefully we'll get there the way the way Hebrew has done so brilliantly. Um, so yeah, so just wanted to say that that purism is, is a real problem. And we need to not fall into it while at the same time, we do need to understand why it's there. Uh, there are there are reasons why people care that the language stays kind of unique and separate. Thank you, Faith. Would anyone else like, oh, Nessie. Yeah, I also want to jump in on that. And I was also reminded of this uh, by something Yusuf said. When I was first trying to look into this, I, I did feel a little uncomfortable going into a group chat of it, mostly 65 year olds and plus people and being like, hey, like, don't tell me slurs, but also maybe tell them to me as well. But like, what do you think about this topic? And like, let's discuss this. And, it went much better than I expected uh, to give uh, older Ladino speakers credit. Um, I, I think there was obviously a couple of people who were like, why are we talking about this? Um, this, is a, this is nothing to do with us. But um, I think most people thought of it as at least an interesting thing to look into, if not something to be supportive of. And like, yeah, this is part of the language that could change and develop. And I think people who work on Ladino revivification do understand that like, 
by looking into the passive language, just like Nomi was saying, we can then use what's already existing to create the words that we need for identities that people haven't expressed proudly before, maybe in Ladino. Um, yeah, and um, I think the, the other thing I wanted to say was I got to this, well, the first word I learned by reading the dictionary. So like the words sometimes are there. Uh, we just need to find them. And sometimes you might need the help of people who are not immediately supportive. But um, so it's like, it's not always easy, but it, there are ways to access it. Yeah. Great. Oh, go ahead. Happy to, to echo that, that, you know, my experience was overall so much gratitude has poured hundreds of emails of people saying thank you so much you know i'm, I'm a non-binary jew and i've been wanting to pray forever or you know my child is going through this rite of passage and thank you for giving us a way to call them up to the torah and so 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 much of that um and as you know as to be expected some ultra conservative news outlets kind of you know <laughs> saying uh, they're changing the Hebrew language, which is really a misunderstanding because we're not out to, to change the language. We're actually adding a third systematic to, to the language. So as, um, as Grace Elizabeth said, a table <laughs> will still be, you know, a certain gender and the sky will still be a certain. We're not trying to change that. We're just adding enough, a way to converse people, to relate, who, who want to use, you know, this systematic. So it's not trying to force people to, to now everything needs to be non-binary. It's really important for me to clarify that. Uh, but it is adding an opportunity. If I want to say sibling, how do I do that in Hebrew? If I want to say partner, how do I do that in Hebrew, which doesn't allow for those words, you know, without some kind of new ending uh, at the end. So that's that. That's one thing. And then you know the other criticism has just been people who, and it usually comes with this heavy Israeli accent of like, what do you mean non-binary? There's no such thing as non-binary. You know, and they, they get into the more uh, you know, kind of the, I don't know, maybe the, they're not quite there yet. So then the conversation kind of gets stuck. There, there's not really a partner in that. Also to add is that I live in the United States and most of the people that I, I teach and, and the people who have been reaching out are not speaking Hebrew as the vernacular. They're using Hebrew for prayer. They're using Hebrew in summer camp. They're using Hebrew, you know, in school. Um, so it's been much easier to do that. And I know that it's much harder to do in Israel where it's Hebrew spoken all the time. And then the resistance would come more from like, well, what, but uh, you know, uh, that's not how Hebrew works, you know, and stuff like that. Here we have the privilege of being, you know, being able to, let's say in a summer camp say, okay, we've got this name for, uh, for a camper and this name for somebody who identifies as a non-binary camper. And it's, it's instantaneous kind of thing. There's no, it's not foreign to the ear like, like it is in Israel. And, and it, at this point, um, as a response to, to, to this work and other people, uh, work that other people are doing, um, as far as I know, the, the Hebrew Academy, which is kind of the, 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 <laughs> the official, so to speak, um, you know, monitor of the language, they're having a task force on this, meaning that they're actually, they're aware that this is an issue. So, you know, my guess is evolution usually comes from the, from the ground up, it's not top down, but so efforts like this and what you're doing here is so wonderful to, to educate people and to, as people are starting to use it more and more, and it's, it's being used in Sidurim, it's printed in, in prayer books, um, they're, they're going to have to do something about that. So that's, that's kind of what's, what, where there's, there's, there's the beginning of a dialogue. <laughs> It's so fascinating because you were just mentioning how we can be fluent in non-binary Hebrew without actually being an everyday Hebrew speaker and something that uh, the Jewish Language Project just posted, which became a viral post on Instagram. And I don't know if this is your work, Grace Elizabeth and Ellen, but the fact that there's a lot of Jewish queer English words that are used by the gay community um and they themselves are not necessarily Jewish using it. And so I found that to be also pretty fascinating. Uh, we have reached our uh, time for the panel, but before, I know time goes by super fast. Uh, I mean, we could nerd out all day long on this, but uh, we do have to respect your time and everyone else's time who's here. Um, what I would love to do is to do a lightning round of questions. This is supposed to be fun, exciting. Don't think too hard on it. And I'm first going to ask Yosef. What is your favorite queer Jewish word? What does it mean? And when do you use it? That's a great question. 
I just need one more minute. I'm sorry. <laughs> Please totally next and come back to me. Thank you. Okay. All right. Next up, we've got Grace Elizabeth. Yeah. My favorite word uh, is one of our participants self identified as a dreidel, which was used as a trans Jewish man to self identify as a Jewish top, which. So good. I love that. All right. We've got Faith. Um, I like the word transminic, which means transgender. And I love that it uses the word mean, which means gender, but also means type, sort, kind. It's a, it's a word that has a lot of, there's a lot of options there for how you interpret it. And what I love about it is that it's actually a it's a it's a more inclusive word than the word transgender. So it could, it just means like I'm a different kind, um, and so it, you could use it in a lot of different ways. So I love I love that. Faith, could you also put it into the chat? Everyone who's saying a word that way we have the spelling for the closed captioning because the artificial intelligence of this particular Zoom room is lackluster. Uh, Nessie, what is your favorite? queer Jewish word, what does it mean, and when do you use it? I think my favorite is uh, de la cinco, or just cinco, which means uh, a five. So someone could be a five, which means they're gay. Um, it's, out, it's not out of anything. It's just an identification, and I'll explain why that came about in the breakout room. Sweet. Ellen. Classical Jewish texts include, in addition to like masculine and feminine, they talk about intersex identities. And one of these, Tomb Tomb, one of our participants is, is reclaiming that as like contemporary non-binary identity. I really, really love that in, in that it shows it's living evidence that transness and queerness is nothing new. These identities have always existed or have existed for hundreds of years. And we have people who are through language being living proof of that. Fantastic. Eyal. So I actually reached out to my dear friend and colleague, uh, Tal Jenner Klausner, who I think is here with us today. See, what's what's a current Hebrew word? And um, um, they suggested uh, if, if Jonathan Van Ness uh, would, would speak Hebrew, like the, the Yas Queen kind of Hebrew is, um, it could pronounce a few different ways. One would be Ochti or Ochch or Ochcha. I'll put that, and it's kind of like the, you know, so it's, it's a, it's like sista kind of thing, and it's also, you know, it's, it's a response to many Israelis use achi, achi, which is a, it's a military term, like, hey, bro, kind of, yo, dude, achi, brother, kind of thing, so this would be the ochcha, och, ochti, and I'll put it both in Hebrew and in English in the chat here. <laughs> That's great. All right, Yosef, coming back to you. For me, it's in Farsi, it's hamgens, which means similar in value and it has like this connotation of like treasure involved also that's so so beautiful thank you everyone for sharing with us uh, a little bit more about you your work your favorite queer jewish words uh, we do have a question from the the zoom chat unfortunately the breakout rooms zoom does not allow us to record the breakout rooms so you will have to choose your own adventure or jump between the rooms. Uh, Ari, who is JQD's chair, has already set up the breakout rooms and shortly will uh, place each of our speakers, uh, with the exception of Grace, Elizabeth, and Ellen, who are in one room. So it'll be five breakout rooms, uh, and that will happen. And then participants in the main room will be invited to uh, go and choose a room. So. Feel free, Ari, to do that. We will have 20 minutes uh, in the mini lesson, and then we will regroup after that. I hope you enjoyed your mini lesson. And uh, what we're going to do now is, actually before we dive into more questions for our panelists, uh, I know you didn't get a chance to go into each of the rooms, uh, materials from our panelists and more will be made available to all of you at our resources link at JQD. The link is in the chat. Uh, definitely follow up and uh, enjoy at your own comfort and leisure.
So for our concluding questions for our panelists, and please do keep your answers relatively short. I also welcome participants who are in attendance today to also answer some of these questions in the chat if you so wish and want to share with everyone. How are you celebrating queer and Jewish identity these days? Can I start? Thank you. Uh, for me, it has been uh, a, a really uh, big journey. Um, for just for context, I'll be very quick. Two years ago, I was uh, deeply in the Orthodox community and deeply closeted. Um, in the past two years, I have taken so much emotional energy uh, to really feel um, in my space and um, in, in my community and uh, showing up really queer and really Jewish and really Persian in all of those spaces has been, um, I think, the most uh, powerful experience for me and had a lot of people really uh, bending their minds to try to understand it and sticking to that has been really powerful. So that is my joy. Thank you. Great question. I can jump in on that. Um, what, so I write for this website uh, called Hablaremos, which means uh, let's talk in Ladino, where we try to do anti-Semitism education uh, and Jewish issues coverage in Turkish. And for International Holocaust Day this year, we co-hosted a panel with Kaos Gele, which is uh, the most prominent uh, queer publication in Turkey. And we were able to bring together people who don't maybe come together on this on discussions of the Holocaust to talk about the genocide of queer people and of Jews and of Romani people who are a big group in Turkey uh, in combination and in conversation. And I think that was really valuable as an experience to me and also to our participants to talk about uh, that experience historically and also predicaments in Turkey today in conversation with each other. And I think what we try to do with Abdelhamos um, and what I try to do there often is to find these sorts of uh, overlaps between different groups and different identities and how we can uh, come together because often we're in the same, uh, same predicaments. One thing, um, one thing I've been doing that I that I find find really helpful and healing is singing queerly in Yiddish. So our the choir that I'm in, the Vancouver Jewish Folk Choir, um, has been bringing in queer music. We sing some of the repertoire of Pepe Littman, the great cross-dressing um, pre-war Yiddish uh, music hall star. Um, she's a an icon, uh, look her up. Um, so we sing some of hers, her material, and we also bring new queer uh, verses into traditional music, and I'm happy to share that with anybody who wants it. Um, so that's one thing I find really joyous and really helps me to feel whole uh, as a queer Jew. Wonderful. I'm going to move on to the next question which is kind of two parts. What has given you inspiration to do this work and to continue to do this work? And what is your hope for the future of queering Jewish languages? Who would like I'm to happy to you? dive in. Um, so inspiration, and I share this in my breakout room. Um, Eliezer ben Yehuda, who revived uh, modern Hebrew, had some chutzpah. It takes some holy chutzpah to renew a language. And I think it takes uh, our both chutzpah and sensitivity and you know, our role as, as allies, my role as an ally, and to, to say, all right, it's, if it's not working, we, we got to do something about it. I, I can't run a classroom where I'm excluding some of my students. That is against my, my value system. So that's the, the inspiration has been, has been my student, uh, Lior, Eliezer Ben Yehuda, um, and my, my hope for future, to realize that language truly has the power to include or exclude, that, that language 
shapes how we think about things. Just to give a little example, in, in, in certain languages, other languages that are binary, if a word is masculine or feminine, people think about that word in, in that context. You know, so if like a word like bridge in one language is masculine and one language would be feminine and people imagine it, describe it in different ways. So it really shapes our world in many ways. So to know that and to evolve the language and to create a community where we're welcoming, like taking on that Abrahamic concept of expanding the tent and, and welcoming each other in. Thank you, Eyal. Alan? I think there's a certain cishet imaginary that when you like, when you say the phrase queer language, that that means you translate the L, you translate the G, you translate the B, you translate the T, and that's what you need. And there's just so much more than that. People are out here creating, discovering, reviving language for ways of kin new forms of kinship, old forms of kinship, of talking about bodies, of talking about relationships to tradition and history. There's just so much more and it's so expansive and it's something we can have fun with. We can write poetry and tell dirty jokes and sing songs in just as much as it is something that we talk about tradition and religion and history in. Grace Elizabeth. Yeah, I find so much inspiration in just working with the younger folks of just what questions they have and what innovations they have and just being like, that is not the conversation I had like 15 years ago with my parents and just taking so much joy in that. As for hopes for the future, I'm really excited to develop the nuances in our language of talking today about the intersectionality of um, Jewish identity and queerness, but also centering your Jews of color experiences, centering Jews by choice, Jews from interfaith families, and what nuanced languages, uh, what nuanced language we can create to better caps encapsulate the complexity of these identities and the joy and the challenges that come with it. So thank you. Uh, Ellen really, uh, kind of summed up what I hope for Latino as well. I think as more and more people speak and learn the language, they'll bring that energy with them. Uh, more and more young people getting into uh, learning Latino will automatically kind of uh, energize us to get more new words and talk more about things that right now people who use Latino day to day don't talk about. Uh, and I'm excited for that to happen. Yeah, I'm I'm super grateful to the younger people who um, who are doing so much of this work and who are really um, taking us in directions that would have been unthinkable when I was learning Yiddish. And it's just so heartening to think that they're going to be our leaders in a few years. I want to give a special shout out to um, Sasha Berenstein in Seattle, who has done um, just so much of the work on queer language in Yiddish. And also, somebody mentioned earlier um, of the terminology bar mitzvah and bat mitzvah um, at the Vancouver Parrot School, where I'm a member, uh, the kids themselves came up with an alternative term, which is pene mitzvah, um, the faces of the mitzvah. And, um, and this is a term that 11 to 13 year olds created. I just want to, uh, my inspiration Really, the first time that I saw a queer alternative was the uh, non-binary Hebrew. So it's an honor to, to meet you, Eyal. Um, and I actually have one of those Sidurim that you mentioned. Um, and from there, I saw you know a lot of queer Yiddish language as well. And that really was the spark for me to, to really dig into some of my own language and heritage. And a big thank you to Dr. Benor, who is was my professor at HUC. Um, and the Hebrew Language Project. And my hope is that the language creates representation um, for queer folks here in LA, in New York, in Iran, and around the world. All right, everybody. Uh, this has been an honor. I am starstruck uh, as to all of you. I think you're all incredible doing amazing work. I'm very thankful that you accepted the invitation to participate in this panel and workshop event. Um, our guests are, again, Eyal, Nessie, Faith, Grace Elizabeth, Ellen, and Yosef. Uh, all of their information uh, and tags are in the chat. That's incredible. Thank you so much. Ari, 
thank you to Ari who's been on Zoom Tech. And thank you to Sarah, uh, our partner organization, Jewish Language Project. And thank all of you for attending and joining us today for JQD Heritage Month 2022, Queer Jewish Languages. Cue the music, Sarah. We're gonna dance our way out of this.